Uh, this is an open session, therefore the information within this talk is suitable for public consumption. Um, my presentation is called Social Capital When Working Together Remotely. Uh, I should start by introducing myself. My name is John Kennedy. I am a producer at Oryx Digital. I've worked within the games industry for over 15 years, though predominantly as a programmer, not a producer. Um, however, I've, I've done many different hats uh, within game development. Um, I actually fell into the games industry. I had no intention in actually working, um, making games. Um, I used to make flash games as a hobby and just put them on my own website. Um, gives you an idea of how old I am. Um, and somebody approached me and said, how do you feel about doing this as a job? Um, and obviously I grabbed that opportunity with both hands and, and haven't looked back since. Um, over the years of working with the games industry, I found there was opportunities um, within the production discipline where I felt like I, you can really make a difference uh, to, to game development. And, and I, was, I became more and more keen to jump into that role and i was very lucky that Oric digital gave me that opportunity two years ago and um and and i jumped and i worked in uh, brewmaster i joined the team on brewmaster for the latter stages and then uh, since, since then i've been working on sea of thieves um as a co-dev uh for with rare uh, where we've created content and, and implemented content for the pirate emporium um with that game um Whilst working as a producer, um, the concept of social capital really caught my attention, and, and which I will go into in a moment. But going back a few years, I wanted to talk about remote working. So when the pandemic hit, many businesses had to rapidly change um, their, their, their workflows and many of us had to work from home to, to, for, for us to keep our jobs, for business to survive. And um, so we're in a bit of a new age, if you like, in the fact that so many of us work remotely um, or if we don't work remotely, um, we work with people who do. And um, as I say, practices have changed when we're working with new tools. Obviously, we're forced to utilizing things like Zoom and what have you, uh, conference calling, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, there, obviously, there are many, many benefits from working remotely. Um, the obvious ones are um, a bit of a, a better work-life balance. Um, I love working from home. It means I don't have to commute to work. Therefore, I get that time back, and I can spend that time with my children, for example. Um, I don't have the, the costs of, of a commute as well. Um, I have uh, more my home comforts. You know, I have my dog that's a, just behind me on the sofa. Um, so yeah, there are obviously many benefits from working remotely. But then, what are the the negatives um, from working remotely? And 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 so the the first one that springs to mind is communication. The communication barriers that come from communicating via text, phone, video calls. Um, there is the 73855 rule, which was developed um, decades ago by a UCLA um, psychology professor, Albert uh, Merabian. Um, and it was uh, popularized in his book, Silent Messages, 1971. And it attempts to uh, quantify the importance of nonverbal communication. And the rule states that basically 7% of the meaning comes from the words. 38% is actually the tone of voice and 55% is body language. Right now, you are getting this. You're getting this small window. This presentation itself was originally meant to be in a room. You know, you, perchance, you, you possibly could have been in that room. And if you think about if I was, if we were sharing that space and I was doing this presentation to you right now and we we're in the same room, think how much more information you would be getting um, rather than right now as i say through this little box the other thing that's uh sort of a, if you like a the a, a negative from working remotely is potential isolation and cabin fever um it's less so for some um you know people that live with family um but those are people that who maybe live on their own don't have flatmates um if they're not 
if they're not commuting to work, going to work, they are in the same four walls without any uh, interaction with with other human beings, which which can, as I say, give a feeling of isolation. So social capital, what is it? Um, this quote is uh, I, I, I really like this quote because I think it really uh, depicts it depicts social capital uh, really well. It came from Margaret Heffernan, who in her book Beyond Measure. And basically the line is, if our team members are the bricks in the wall, social capital is the mortar in between those bricks. So the idea being is that the concept of social capital is that it's the accumulation of the everyday social habits um, that can sustain and improve a team's performance and productivity. So the idea being is that in times of crisis or high pressure, say milestone deliverables, for example, um, the more social capital a team has, the better they will perform under those conditions. But it will deplete over time. So therefore, you, you need to constantly uh, top up that social capital pot. And social interactions are, are what add to that social capital pot. Um, so if you think about when we do, say, work in an office, there are many opportunities to um, add to that pot. So from commuting to work, if you if you uh, travel to work on the bus or the train with someone, you're chatting to them uh, whilst commuting. Whilst you're in the office, um, you get up to make a cup of tea, stick the kettle on somebody else in the kitchen as well. You end up having a chat. Um, sat in the office on your desk someone has a conversation over your head and you turn around because you've got something to contribute to that conversation going for lunch going to the supermarket and buying a sandwich these are all interactions these organic interactions that happen all the time that we just don't have when we're working remotely now the other theory, the other thing to mention is that social capital compounds with time so teams that work together for uh, longer get better because it takes time to build trust and candor and openness, which is what you need within your team. So, <clears throat> excuse me, with that in mind, with the remote working and the idea of social capital, I started asking the questions like, can we actually cultivate social capital when we work remotely? Is that actually possible? Um, and if so, how can we quantify it? Um, and then, therefore, if we, if we can quantify it, how do we prove that it actually works? So the first thing I did was I made time for tea. Which is basically every Friday I set it up so that there was a half an hour meeting and it was optional that where people could come together like cam to cam um, and um, just talk about anything, anything really. Preferably not about work, uh, but yes, yeah, so just anything, anything that's going on in their lives from family politics to Black Mirror to, um, I don't know, Smash Brothers to is Jaffa cake actually a biscuit or is it a cake? And if it's a cake, why is shortbread not called short biscuit? Anyway. Um, so the idea was it was just to mimic the chat um, that you get from a social lunch or when you're sat and stood in the kitchen, as I say, when the kettle's boiling. Um, and I just wanted it so it was a very relaxed. And as I say, people could just talk about anything and everything. The other thing I did was I needed to try and gather some data um, about the team. So what I actually did was I, I set up a team survey. Um, and I asked the, uh, asked the team to um, complete this survey every couple of months or so. And he, the survey, the questions stayed the same and they were all rated from one to five, low, one being negative, five being positive. Um, and as I say, the questions w stayed the same. They were all about well-being and happiness within the project, um, confidence within themselves or the confidence they had to support others. Um, and isolation. So it was it was questions revolving around the, those areas. And the aim was that this team survey took two or three minutes. It was unintrusive. It was it was easy to do. It was and so the responses were instinctive. My aim was to get honest answers, basically. So I didn't want it to be a chore. So whilst getting asking people to do that, what I also did was I noted 
the um, a tendency at the the Friday get together brew at two um, and just made a note of who was attending. So. What was really useful, the immediate sort of benefit of gathering that team survey data was that I was then able to see if people well, basically gauge if people were OK. Um, so it was quite surprising that uh, some responses, um, you know, people were more stressed than I realized, for example, which was incredibly powerful because then it gave me the opportunity to sort of the flag for me to go and have a conversation or instigate a conversation um, just to get context for that response, if you like, um, and have the opportunity to talk to them and offer support if they if it was needed. The other thing I, what I wanted to do was I wanted to focus um, on basically what I wanted to do was look at the three highest attendees to the brew at two and compare their answers to the team survey um, with the team average. And what I want to gather is, is what I want to understand is whether those that go to the social get together once a week more often than not, whether that impacts on the results that they give, their answer they give onto that survey. And what I also want to do is focus on the trajectories rather than the individuals. I wanted to focus on the trajectories and it was it spanned over um, the best part of a year. And. The indications were when getting the uh, these results was that it does actually work. Um, so. When looking at isolation, um those people that were the the higher attendees to the brew at two ha felt less isolated so the team average was 2.75 so it's as i say the questions were answered from one to five um, and the team average was 2.75 it actually gone down over that period that year of by 0.4 whereas the um team members that were regularly attending the brew at two um, one stayed always at three and then another one went from two to four and another one went from one to two. So both those two actually went up by a factor of two, which is very interesting. Um, the individuals that attended the Brew at Two More were slightly more confident in supporting others. So the team average was four and, and those those three individuals were a five, five and four. So slightly better. Um, but they were more likely to ask for help. And this is quite interesting because the team average was 2.4, ended at 2.4. But over that period of time, it had gone down by 2.15. Um, and those 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 three individuals that were the highest attendees um, had all ended at four. One stayed at four always. One had gone down by one, but one had gone up by one. But again, their trajectories were far better than the team average. Um, when it came to being happier within the project, um, there was no real sway here nor there, really. It wasn't um, whether you attended the brew at two or not. You didn't really affect how happy you were within the project. So. I say that it indicated that it was working because. We don't live and work within a bubble. So there are so many outside factors that influence the results that people give within the survey. So, for example, um, project milestones. So if they're if we're close to a, a high pressure milestone um, like uh, um, like a release candidate milestone um, that would, you know, eventually influence their results because that, that, they're more stressed. Um, team changes can um, affect the, the results. So there is um, Tuckerman's stage of group development, the four stages forming, storming, norming and performing, uh, which is the idea is that if someone, if the team changes, if, if people join a team, for example, the dynamic changes. And so they go, you revert back to the, the storming where people are starting, are getting to know each other basically, oh, sorry, the forming. And then the storming is where they're getting to know each other. Um, and then to the norming, which is settling down. And then once they got used to where they sit within each other, they get into the performing stage. So every time you change a team, you do have to go through that process. Um, then, um, 
also there's people's personal lives we don't know what's going on in people's lives outside of work um you know whether they're, they're struggling with uh, in their own re in relationships or family or not sleeping very well because their children are up all night we don't know and so all these uh factors will influence uh, and skew the data that we, we receive so therefore that's why i say it indicates um that it was working but we can't get the full picture we don't we'll never be able to get the full picture what i would say though is that the longer you do the do the survey possibly the clearer the picture might be over time so where is the value in in gathering this data well the immediate value was if someone gave a response in the team survey that were, went against their previous responses so if they were feeling supported and they were at a three and then suddenly they gave a response and it was a one then that would actually give uh, it would flag up an opportunity for me to go and have a chat or instigate myself or their lead or whoever to have a conversation with them um, about um, you know why that, that you know were they okay and offer support um, and that was one of the key things is kind of just to get context as to why and, and 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 if they did need support we were there to be able to offer that support the other thing that's quite interesting is that if you're gathering data um, and then you change the project somehow you change the workflow and then you continue to gather data you can then compare the difference the before and after and understand the impact your change has had to the workflow for example so that's actually quite a powerful tool to have um, and then the other thing which is it gives the individuals an opportunity for them to highlight how they're feeling and the reason why i say that is because on my team survey what i actually did was the final section i i put just the section saying um any notes and this was basically an opportunity for feedback there was there was no real agenda it was just an opportunity for individuals to say what was on their mind um and the response i got were quite surprising people were saying oh thank you for asking and it's really it's it's a really good idea to ask and um and, and it's nice to know you care and i didn't realize until that point that the survey itself was a form of communication and therefore the survey itself was actually building social capital which led me to my penny drop moment, which was all interactions, no matter how small um, or what formats they come in, they all impact on our teams. And even doing the questionnaire to gather data was a form of interaction that added to the social capital pot. So if the indications are there, if, you know, building social capital um, does have value, um, what can we do? Um, <clears throat> at Oric, we have a policy where our dailies is the only meeting where we request that we have cameras on. Um, and the reason why we do that is that we had feedback, basically, that people feel less isolated if they have they can see the faces that they're, of the people they're working with uh, rather than an initial or, or, I, or an avatar. Um, so we actively encourage that people use that have the cameras on on the on the dailies. However, we do say that um it's not mandatory if you don't want to have your camera on just let your producer know beforehand and then we can then have that conversation again it gives the opportunity for us to ask why is everything okay offer support if needed um <clears throat> the other one is try to be early for meetings if you think about when we're working from in the office sorry um and you go in for a meeting the meeting room you generally get there a couple of minutes early if you're organized and what happens is you sit down somebody else comes in and you end up having a chat and you're having that organic uh, uh you know organic opportunity if you like for for a chat so in a meeting when going to meetings rather than just joining bang on the dot um why not join a few minutes earlier Obviously, you're prepared for the meeting already. So when people join, you can have the opportunity to have a conversation with them. Ask how they're doing. What did they get up to last night? Did you have a good weekend, et cetera, et cetera. But then also remember the responses and come back to them. You know, so you tell them, so I went to see the film you talked about last weekend. You, know, you went to see last weekend. Great movie or whatever. But the point being is that it, you're actually having active conversations and then you come back to them. And that really helps reinforce the, the the bonds if you like and, and the friendships that you would get naturally if you were sharing the same space 
Um, another thing is is create meetings that have the opportunity for interactions. Um, so what I mean by this is that we have um, art forums going on with, within our project for the different disciplines. And that's a point where we it's a bit of a show and tell. So people can talk about the assets they're working on, challenges they're trying to overcome, getting feedback from peers, um, and also sort of celebrate the wins, you know, the champagne moments. So people turn around and go, that just looks amazing, you know. Um, and they're really, really good team bonding meetings to have those show and tell meetings. Um, obviously, outside of work, you can have out of hours, uh, things like board gaming nights, virtual, you know, virtual nights. We actually have um, a thing called Social Club, um, which is basically where people come together. It's a space where people come together on Discord on a Thursday evening and people can just join and have a chat whilst making doing whatever they're doing so if they're you know uh you know developing their own game or painting miniatures or whatever it is and it's just a space where people can just have a chat whilst working on their own projects um which has been massively successful um i mean you can see on this slide some of the channels that we have on teams um pets of Orc is is a very popular one where people can just post pictures of their their pets um who doesn't like to see pictures of cats and dogs and rabbits and and you know and geckos um it's amazing we even had a situation where somebody um did a live stream of their of the dog um asleep on a chair and people just had it on their second monitor just to have a dog sleeping just it's very therapeutic but um and the other thing is to advertise these channels actively encourage people to utilize these these social channels um and um we have a company wide where um each each company wide um people uh, will advertise what's going on both in the channels but then events that are going on at, you know outside of work so just basically actively um, encourage the social interactions um i mean we have a parenting channel here uh, for example and um that was set up uh, with myself and uh, a colleague we both have children of similar age and we set up a channel because we found it was it would be really nice to just share our stories and ask questions if we need advice um a safe space to rant um if our children aren't sleeping or that sort of thing um and it it, it it was incredibly therapeutic for us to the point now that we've actually taken it and we actually do our own podcast um on parenting so um yeah i think that's all i want to say about this slide so <clears throat> where is the value um in building social capital from a business sense well the idea being is the same before is that the high social capital a uh, team with high social capital means they have good social relationships and these good social relationships um allow for collaboration trust respect um, and and allowing for a, a reliance and a supportive uh, environment um, uh, for the team, which in turn can lead to increased productivity. Um, MIT did uh, research. We took hundreds of volunteers and put them into groups and gave them really hard problems to solve. Um, and the most successful groups weren't those that um, had the highest IQs or, um, or you know cumulatively or individually. The, the most successful groups had three key characteristics. The first one was they showed high degrees of social sensitivity to each other. So basically empathy. Um, and what they did was they had a test called reading the mind in the eye uh, test, which um, people who scored highly in that test um, were th th in those groups were the ones that actually were more successful in problem solving. The uh, and second characteristic was that the groups gave roughly equal time to each other. So there was no overly domineering characters within the group. And there were no passengers either, for that matter. And then the third characteristic was that there was more women in the groups. Um, now, it's good because women sco generally score h more highly in the empathy test. Um, it could be that it's more a diverse perspective. They weren't really sure. But the key takeaway is that the social connectedness that they had with each other, it meant that ideas could grow and flow and people don't waste energy on on working on bad solutions because they have that they have the ability to be confident to speak their mind and trust have a trust and uh, therefore be candid with each other and what it does it creates a a, a culture of helpfulness um 
there is also a TED talk by Margaret Heffernan called Heffernan, sorry, um, called Super Chicken, and basically where a, a, an evolutionary biologist, William Muir at Purdue uh, University, studied chickens, and he was interested in their product productivity, and you could measure their productivity by the number of eggs they produce and what he did is he took a group of average chickens and and just monitored them for six generations and then took a second group where he selected the highest producing chickens the super chickens and then each generation he would select the highest producers what happened at the end of those six generations that the first group were fine they were healthy egg production had gone up um whereas the second group all but three chickens were dead. They had literally pecked the rest to death. So those individually productive chickens have only achieved their success by su suppressing the productivity of the rest. Um, and this super chicken model is used in businesses, um, you know, where we uh, have pecking orders and we focus on the superstars and, and we give them the power. But this basically does lead to aggression and dysfunction. The idea being is that increasing competition actually leads to poor performance which is the opposite of building social capital. Um, so the idea being is that if you have uh, a, a good social capital you and you have candor and openness and trust, good ideas can come about. And it allows people to discuss problems and solutions openly. Um, and everyone has a voice. And so therefore, like if if we don't have trust, then people don't feel safe and therefore collaboration fails. So, but what is actually the benefit for a business with this? Well, the first one is obviously milestones. If you've got a team that can perform under high pressure scenarios, i.e. milestones, um, then they're going to be able to more, be more resilient and support each other. And they'll be able to achieve the deliverables within the milestones. And revenue can be dependent on milestones. So ensuring that we deliver on milestones, it means we, either we get paid or we don't. The other thing is, is that it, it, if, people, if our staff are happier and feel more supported, in theory, they should, we should be able to keep our, store, our staff. So turnover costs money um, and training new team members up costs money. Um, Auric Digital does actually spend a lot of time and effort in building social capital um, within, uh, within the studio. And I asked uh, for some numbers, or like sort of retention numbers, just out of curiosity um, with Auric Digital and, and, and Sumo. Um, and the, the results, the, 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 the percentage I got was very interesting. So when looking at resignations as a whole, in 2023, Sumo Group, the percentage of resignations for the whole of Sumo, Sumo Group was 8.11%. For the UK, Sumo UK, it was 7.55%. Um, for Oric Digital, in 2000, this is, again, as I say, 2023, um, the percentage was... 4.1%. We do need to recognize, though, that there are many factors that contribute to, to this data. You know, obviously, there's projects and, you know, there's, there's so many factors that, uh, that, that will influence these, these percentages. But again, it would seem to indicate that the higher social capital does improve your staff retention. So, the added benefit of being nice is that you save money. And what a wonderful world we live in where I can say that and make a statement like that in this presentation, that by being nice and, 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 and putting in the effort of being sociable with our staff um, actually saves us money. I wish I, wish I could say I, I came up with that line, but Pete Willington did actually say that to me. So, Pete, I'm just... It, you, not me. Next slide. So in conclusion, um, with every chat, channel, meeting, survey, um, club, photo shared and the social capital pot fills. But we just need to rem promote and encourage these interactions, no matter how small. There are, so, so there are endless opportunities that we have um, to facilitate the social interactions uh, when we w work remotely. Um, and they are very easy to do. It's just that we have to recognize these opportunities and make sure we action them. Thank you very much. Any questions?
Hey everyone, uh, thanks for joining in and uh, and thanks for watching John's talk today. Um, John is here live wearing, wearing, the, wearing the same shirt. The continuity is 10 out of 10. Um, so yeah, let's, let's go straight to the questions, John. Um, so the first one I'm going to put to you is, um, I really believe body language of being able to know the real human being behind the team's icon is important when working as a team. But not everybody is comfortable turning cameras on, especially the younger generation who never experienced working on site. How would you gently introduce the camera on system? Of course, I'm not talking about forcing people, but making them consider it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a really good question. I think, um, as I was saying in the talk, we will only have one uh, meeting where we ask people to have the cameras on. Um, and that is the daily, which will be just the, the project specific. But I think, and obviously, you would, if those the individuals that wouldn't want to have the camera on at at, within that meeting then you'd have a conversation with them and work with them and work out and you know ask why and I think one of the easy or more obvious ways of approaching it would be okay so if it, I understand it can be incredibly daunting to put your camera on especially if you're working within a wide a large group you know if you've got 30 plus people on the screen that's quite it is quite intimidating so I'd say maybe start on the smaller uh meetings even as a start as a one-to-one -one with with me maybe it's like, let's have a camera and let's have a chat face to face um, and then maybe start with whether it was a, a, a maybe a discipline meeting where you have three or four people together. Try putting the camera on there. See how feel they feel with having the camera on with it when it's a smaller number of people, and then speak to them afterwards. That like, obviously just um, get their view on the experience afterwards, and then help them build up their confidence. Um, and, and I get it, totally get it. Like you know, even the most confident of people some days will not want to have the camera on. They're just not feeling the love. They maybe they're, they're full of cold and they just feel, you know, horrible. And so they'll turn around and say, you know, I'm not comfortable having my camera on. And that's fine. We're all human, you know. So, um, I mean, that is kind of one of the benefits of working from home, that you do actually have that option. that You can still work and yet not have to be, you know, um, if, you know, if you're sat in your pyjamas because you're just not feeling up to it, then do you know what I mean? You, you still can, basically. So, yeah, I hope that answers that question. Yeah, I think it does. And um, this wasn't planned, but my I heard my daughter sneeze as soon as you mentioned kind of people having a cold. So, uh, yeah, be beautiful. Um, thank you very much, John. So the next question I've got for you is um, I found that some people don't really want work to be a social club and object to the idea that succeeding socially at work is needed to succeed in their career. How do you gain the benefits of social capital without excluding or disadvantaging people who don't want to be social for its own sake? People whose role is to consider wider scale team structure might be self-selecting group who are more likely to consider pro-social as their preferred option or even the correct viewpoint. Yeah, um, I think this is, uh, this is why it's really important to try and incorporate the social interactions during your normal working day um, um not everyone can do those extracurricular stuff um and it's uh, after hours for example i'm one of them i have i have two children uh, young children i just don't have the time uh, to be able to uh, be a part of those uh, those extra um social activities so i think that's why it's important to focus on it during the normal working day and this is why i mentioned with regards to when if you're going into a meeting if you're in the office and you're going to a meeting um you generally you'll have those those two minute chats you know before the meeting starts and it's those it's those organic interactions and so i would say i totally agree it's 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 a case of making sure that don't rely on those extra out of hours uh, interactions to fill that pot. They are brilliant to have. Don't get me wrong. And yeah, more for them, because uh, for those people that really thrive on that opportunity, then they should be given that opportunity. For, but for those of us who, who don't, then that's why it's, it's very important that we um, allow those opportunities during working hours as part of our working uh, our workflow if you like um and and whether that is as i say through um you know like being being there early in the meetings or whether it's a, a or a sort of meetings where discussions are setting up meetings where open discussions are more uh the more format the better the format that the, the, the meeting want, you want to take um so if it's a case where you're having a situation where you're trying to overcome a problem you're looking at um i don't know you're look, looking at 
um, estimating, uh, a good one is like estimating work. So um, uh, planning poker, for example, that's a great exercise in in um, being able to get a team to estimate the, the time required to to complete um, a, a task or or a set of work and it's also a brilliant social interactive experience because people are able to voice their opinions like um in terms of just sorry i don't want to people teach people to suck eggs but the idea being is that planning po poker you give a, an item um, and then everybody at the same time says how many hours they think that work is or how many days i should say they think that work is and then if there's a disparity people can then discuss and say well i thought it was actually a week's worth of work because when i did this before it was very complex when we went down this avenue or or what have you and then you're getting that interaction that those discussions and and that's all building up the social capital pot but it's a part of the working day if that makes sense so it's i would say to get so i would say you should really focus on on the day-to-day -day, the nine to five interactions um obviously allow for those opportunities encourage those opportunities outside but 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 yes you are right so you shouldn't be we shouldn't be sort of relying on those to be a part of you know only those extracurricular activities to be the things that are filling up the social pot Great answer, John, and a, a, a lot to unpack from that. And uh, yeah, the kind of the, the, the planning poker, it just sounds like an amazing idea. Um, how did you find that these techniques evolved as folks got more used to remote working and the pandemic settled down? I think um, as individuals, we've um, it's, bec it's become normalised a little bit. I think, I mean, you think about when it all first started and everybody was on Zoom and, um, you know, the, the the issues of getting people together at the same time and connection people, you know what I mean? Like technophobes, you know, people having to suddenly work with Zoom, for example. So there's there's an evolution of, uh, of users, if you like, and it's become much more normal. But I think technology wise, that's improved. Um, even Teams, the fact that Teams now you've got the shortcut, the cast shortcut, control alt, shift t when you're streaming to improve the the frame rate for example if you want to be showing uh content um uh, live um so i think our tools are are improving even when you I mean, for example when we're if I'm in a meeting with uh, a team of people at, at rare for example they'll have a meeting room and there's a camera on the whole on the whole team around the table but then it can be divided up into individuals so they all then come up with their own little um uh, icons doing little squares as though they're all working remotely um and um basically so there are the tools are evolve, evolving constantly and i think it's recognized now that there is a need for for that because so many people do actually work remotely now so even we are now at the point where we're actually s separating people out in the meeting room to be separate windows in a screen um so yeah the tools are are evolving constantly but i think also so are we in terms of how we we use them and how it is becoming uh, normalized um in in every meeting that we have almost so thanks john and the last question that i'll put to you um while we're live here is what is the biggest challenge with working remotely in regards to downtime you would say that you have faced um see uh that's a good question um I um, the way I get around it is I have a workspace. I'm lucky enough to be able to have a, a room that I can class as my office. This room It's also the gaming room and, and the cinema room. But um, generally, it's a case of I have a door that I can when I when I shut down my PC, I can go out the door and I close the door and that's it. And so so mentally I can switch off from work um, in the past. They had, I think I think. I mean, some people can do it, but I, I really struggled to take my laptop, for example, into a nice space in the house um, because when I stopped work, there was no point of there was no separation. And so you'd be you, you can't be looking at your computer and nobody you shouldn't be doing that. You should you need to stop stop thinking about work to um, to um, give your head a chance to sort sort itself out if you like and switch off and 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 so you can recharge you don't come you don't come back to it the next day burnt out if that makes sense um so yeah i think having a workspace is a big difference again when you're working when you're not working remotely you have that time uh, for a commute 
So if you're on a train or on the bus or driving, you have that window of half an hour or so, um, uh, you know, if you're lucky um, to be able to sort of just compartmentalize what's happened, sort through your head and get your head into into home mode, basically. But when you're working remotely, you don't have that. You literally it's five seconds and I'm in the kitchen playing with my kids. So um, I think. For me, if I'm if particularly in a high pressure, if I'm if I'm in a a bit more stressed, I suppose is the right way of putting it. I will actually try and take the dog out for a walk. It's getting that that space, not just physically, but space and time to be able to just switch off and work. So if you do need to just shut down from work to go and and just go for a walk, fifteen minute walk with the dog. If you haven't got a dog, or or jump on the bike and go for a, go for a cycle, or or whatever it is that that whatever you need, I think. They're the two they're the two things. The physical space, if you can separate that, then that's a big difference. That makes a big difference. And then also the time. Allow yourself time to then switch off from work before you go into, you know, relaxed non-work mode, basically. Lovely stuff. John, that's the end of the questions. Thank you so much for, for doing this, for, for doing the talk, um, for practicing, for all the time you put in. You're really generous with your time. Um, I love talking to you and thank you so much for answering everyone's questions. And thank you so no much for, for, for tuning in and, and, and watching the talk today. I really hope it was useful. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Take care.